On the evening of July the 13th last year, all eyes were fixed on the last candidate left standing after the brief but bloody battle to succeed David Cameron. Out of the immediate shot of the cameras, an unassuming figure, barely known outside Westminster, looked on with pride as Britain's second female Prime Minister took office. This week the Prime Minister stood on her own in Downing Street, but this was no lonely figure. Theresa May finally decided to take her uncharacteristic gamble in the presence of just one other person, her husband Philip May, during a walking holiday in Snowdonia. Philip May's central role at a defining moment for the Prime Minister shows he is an indispensable member of her political inner circle. Much attention has been paid to the number 10 Joint Chiefs of Staff Nick Timothy and Fiona Hill. But Theresa May is loath to take any big political decision without first consulting her husband. It is truly a marriage of equals. I think it's hard to contest the view that Philip Hammond, the Chancellor, is only the second most important Philip living on Downing Street. Philip is clearly acting as uh, informally uh, an advisor to uh, Theresa, probably much as Dennis did to Margaret Thatcher. He will stand up to her. And I think sometimes she tests ideas against him and he'll put a different point of view. She always listens to Philip. You know, the, she will listen. She might not act on it, but she'll listen. Friends who knew the couple when they met 40 years earlier would never have bet that it would be Theresa May walking in to number 10. If you look back into the history, rather than looking at how it sort of turned out, you might have thought, well, Phil would go into politics. But, you know, obviously he didn't. But I think he's been very supportive, and that's what you see, and that's what you see today, uh, that the interest has stemmed from his politics, but Theresa's the one who then went mainstream. Oxford, a cradle of ambition for many wannabe Prime Ministers, provided a lyrical setting for the start of the May Partnership. The future Pakistan Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto played Cupid to what initially seemed an unlikely pairing. He was two years below her. Well, to be honest, to a 20-something-year-old, he, he seemed a bit young. Um, he only just passed the height test because Theresa liked her boyfriends to be at least as tall as her. And I think he only just about passed his muster. In those heady days of the 1970s, it turned out that Philip May wasn't her first Oxford romance. Well, she certainly seemed to be trialling a fair number. And uh, I'm not sure many got very serious, but there were a number she went out with. Um, but once Philip appeared on the scene, it rather felt like the rest went by the way. So. Theresa May made what one friend described as desultory attempts to pursue a career at the Oxford Union. She never held office herself, but returned to her alma mater as her future husband embarked on his own union career. Within a year of escorting one well-known figure to a 1978 debate, Philip May had secured the coveted post of union president for himself, around the time that Margaret Thatcher entered number 10 with her own low-key consort in tow. Well, he was very ambitious. I think it's fair to say that he wasn't an exciting speaker. Um, he was a sort of worthy, middle-of-the-road conservative. There were a lot of pretty colourful people around who were, I think, more obviously um, uh, going somewhere as, as politicians. The following year, Philip May married Theresa Brazier. Shortly afterwards, Theresa May, an only child, lost both her parents. I had huge support in my husband, and that was very important for me. I mean, he was a real rock for me.
Theresa and Philip May knuckled down in the city in the 1980s as it underwent the Big Bang upheaval, but they shunned the yuppie lifestyle to focus on building their political base in southwest London. You probably know how political parties work. There's a lot of fundraising which has to take place, the inevitable raffle and things like that which go to you. And obviously as the local agent, my job was to make sure we kept the organisation going uh, and that we focused upon raising some cash and some money too. And she was very much, uh, and they were very much, very much leaders of the local Conservative Party. Philip May. At the 1986 Conservative Party conference, the 29-year-old Philip May showed he still had ambitions on the national stage. I guess that most people would think that foreign affairs isn't exactly a very sexy subject. The delivery was a tad wooden, though he had a clear message on one contentious issue. Britain's been a member now of the European community for some 13 years. During that time, we've helped to change many things in Europe for the good, and I hope that we'll continue to do so. We need to strengthen the economic base of the community by breaking down the barriers to the free movement of goods and services. But you know, Europe's not just an economic community, it's a political community too. In the early 1990s, it was Theresa May who stood for Parliament, unsuccessfully. By then, Philip May's own political ambitions were waning. I asked him years later, if, after Theresa became an MP, if he thought he might become one too. And he said, no, we've discussed it, but we think one in the family is probably quite sufficient. And I think they felt that was, it would be too much work and drawn too many ways. And he does an awful lot in the constituency. Again, it's the support side. And he, he always has, you know, wherever. He, he sort of supports her job. So Philip May decided to concentrate on his city career in asset management with a focus on client relations. He was an unflashy and low-key figure as his wife's political career rocketed after her election to Parliament in 1997. One senior Tory MP who has known the couple since Oxford believes that Philip May's city background leaves him well placed to advise the Prime Minister on the dangers posed by Brexit. They both know, I think it's becoming more evident that in public policy too, that uh, leaving the EU and returning to WTO rules would be a high risk strategy for Britain and that we need a deal and the financial services sector in particular uh, needs to have a way of getting access to continental European markets. Uh, he knows a lot about that subject from his background in insurance and other parts of the financial world and I expect he's feeding those thoughts in. At a time when many of their contemporaries are retiring, Theresa May's new role has prompted her husband to make one career change of his own. He's still working four days a week. He just said he'd given up one day a week to, to run, run the private side. He said, well, Theresa has no time for it. So he said, anything on our personal side, I've got to run. Over the coming weeks, Theresa May will portray herself as the ultimate safe pair of hands. No doubt, Steady Phil will help to reinforce that message. They're not the most exciting people. Um, but then, as you know, in politics, being dull is not always a disadvantage um, if you're dull at the right time in the right place. This formula has served the maze well. Perhaps the rise that has taken the Prime Minister all the way to the top would have been less easy without her rock. Philip said to me, Theresa says it's a job and you have to put it to one side when you've finished it. And I think the fact she could go home to Philip maybe talk things through with him and then put it aside is a way of surviving it.